Hey, everybody. Before we get into the Queen Charlotte recap, if you need a Bridgerton recap, I've got you covered. Just hit the tab in the upper right-hand corner so you know everything that's going on. Now, Queen Charlotte kicks off in Germany, which is where Charlotte is from. She's not a queen yet, though. She has been betrothed to King George, and she's not happy about it. Her brother Adolphus, though, signs the papers, and reluctantly, Charlotte has to go along with him to London. And she's pissed off. She's 17 years old. She didn't have a say in this thing. She doesn't know this guy. She doesn't know anything about George. She feels like she should have some say. She definitely feels like Adolphus should kind of have her back. While they're in the carriage arguing about this, and she's throwing a little bit of a temper tantrum, Adolphus finally gets sick of it and says, Look, I didn't have a choice. The largest country in the world came calling for you. So what was I supposed to do? Say no? Possibly start a war? No, I had to. And the reason might not be good. I realize that nobody like us has ever married someone of royalty before. But when they came calling, I couldn't risk creating an enemy of the British Empire. And what Adolphus is referring to is the fact that he, along with Charlotte, are black. So when Charlotte questions why she is the one to be chosen, he just points out that he's aware that might be the actual reason. While she's not happy about it, she, just like Adolphus, doesn't have a choice. And a little while later, they arrive in England and they meet with Princess Augusta, who is George's mother. She inspects Charlotte. She gives her approval. But Charlotte shows a little bit of spunk when she fights for her own wedding dress although that's a battle that she loses. The princess is adamant that Charlotte will wear their own wedding dress because it's more, quote, British. The good news, though, is she passed the test, and she also got a lapdog. His name is Brimsley, who she is shocked to learn will follow her everywhere five paces behind, whether she likes it or not. The king, by the way, also has one of these lapdogs. His name is Reynolds. But as Charlotte is getting accustomed to this new kind of lifestyle, the princess goes to meet with some advisors, and while she gave the approval for Charlotte, she's not all that happy. Her main gripe is that Charlotte is, quote, too brown. She actually asks at one point if they can go back on the paperwork, but it's too late. Signed and delivered. What the princess is really worried about is that people will talk. As Adolphus pointed out, this is the first that this is happening. But just as quickly as the princess voices this, she realizes, wait, we're the kingdom, we're the church, we're everything. It's not a big deal unless we make it a big deal. If we tell people this is okay, it's going to be okay. In order to really hammer this point home that Charlotte and her skin color was intentional, they're going to expand the guest list. The issue is the wedding is only in six hours, but they're going to send out invitations anyway. And one of those invitations ends up at the home of Agatha Danbury and her much older, yet surprisingly sexually active husband. Even though she's pretty young, she's already had four children. So every time they have sex, she has a hot bath hoping to God that there's not a fifth. She does, however, have a friend that she confides in. It's one of the houseworkers named Coral. Coral knows how Agatha truly feels about her husband. But neither of them expected to be invited to the royal wedding. They show up, and the princess walks over, recognizes Agatha's husband, and says, Your father was friendly with his late majesty. I'm so pleased you two made it. Lord Danbury. That is the real surprise. Because when these two walked into the palace, they weren't lord and lady. But the princess just made it so, reassuring them that the king will send over the paperwork to make it official. Not only that, Agatha is going to appear on the queen's court. So these two made a really good decision to RSVP, yes. But there might not be a wedding. Brimsley can't find Charlotte at all. He's getting concerned. And that's probably because as Charlotte was getting dressed, she asked everybody what the king was like, and nobody would give her a straight answer. Just telling her that she would be happy, and she was going to bear a lot of children. And that probably scared a 17-year-old girl off. But as Brimsley looked all over the place for the queen... The queen is actually found by King George. He finds her in the garden, trying to hop over the wall. Although initially, Charlotte doesn't realize that she's talking to the king. And she unwisely explains to him why she's trying to climb over the wall. How she's set to marry what appears to be an ogre, because nobody can tell her anything about this guy, so he must be really, really bad. Charlotte, thinking that George is just one of the help at the house, asks him over the wall, but he says, no, I'm not going to help a woman who doesn't want to marry me. And that's when Charlotte realizes that 
that's George. That's your future husband. And George looks like a poor man's Dave Franco, which is a compliment, a far cry from an ogre. She feels horrible. She starts apologizing, gesturing, but he says, no, don't call me your majesty. Call me George. Just George. This guy is the exact opposite of who she thought he would be. He's extremely down to earth. He seems very nice. And he makes her feel very, very comfortable. He actually jokes around with her that she's too beautiful to marry him because, after all, he's a troll and people would talk. She tries to explain that she's just scared because she doesn't know him. And he says, well, what do you want to know? She says, everything. So he says, okay, I was born prematurely and everyone thought I was going to die, but I didn't. I'm an okay fencer. I'm an even better shot. My favorite food is mutton. I won't eat fish. It's horrible. I like books, art, and great conversation. Most of all, though, I like science. Chemistry, physics, botany, especially astronomy. I love astronomy. I'm also quite the farmer, and I probably would be a farmer if I wasn't, you know, a king. And I'm also extremely nervous about marrying a girl that I've only just met minutes before our wedding. This conversation gets interrupted by Adolphus, who runs up yelling at Charlotte, we've been looking everywhere to find you, but once he realizes that Charlotte is talking to the king, his mood suddenly changes. Adolphus tries to assure George that Charlotte's very excited, but George says, oh no, she's still making up her mind. She might go over the wall instead, but either way, the choice is entirely up to her. When it comes time, though, to actually go down the aisle, Charlotte decides to do that instead of going over the wall. She marries George. It's a beautiful ceremony. And at the end of it, England has a new queen. They go to the reception. They dance. Everybody seems to have a good time. And at the end of the night, they say goodbye to their guests as they're leaving. And Charlotte gets a glimpse at how her life has suddenly changed within a couple of hours. Because Adolphus goes to leave, but they don't say goodbye like a brother and sister normally would. He treats her like the queen, bowing, telling her that he prays that she soon be blessed with children, calling her ma'am. And it's a little bit of a shock to Charlotte because these two were screaming at each other in a carriage a day ago. Charlotte also meets Lady Danbury for the first time. And Danbury introduces herself, telling her, I'm going to be on your court. And Charlotte says, that's great, then we will be great friends. But then Lady Danbury gets close to the queen and says, be careful, ma'am. And know that if you send for me, I shall come. Lady Danbury can't expound on that because her husband calls her to leave. Once everybody is gone, the king and the queen get in their carriage. They head home. And the king tells Charlotte, I've got a present for you. But the present is this giant house. And it looks amazing. He's had it decorated just for her. But her good mood changes when she finds out that he's not planning on staying. She can't quite fathom how she's supposed to stay alone in this house. And he is going to stay at an estate in a place called Q. She thought this would go like normal wedding nights go. They would spend at least a little bit more time together, sleep in the same room, you know, maybe do some adult stuff. But the king had other plans. They're going to go their separate ways. That's when you get a glimpse at the happy couple's first fight. It's adorable. She's upset because he's blowing her off on their wedding night. He can't figure out what the problem is because he just gifted her this giant house. As he went to leave, she says, George, is this how it's supposed to be? And he says, yeah. This sparks another fight, one that George desperately doesn't want to be in. But the queen demands some answers. She wants to know exactly why he thinks this is a good idea. He finally snaps and just yells, I decide. I have decided I am your king. And Charlotte looks at him and says, oh, my apologies. I thought you were George. Just George. Good night, your majesty. And she leaves. And George feels like an ass for saying that. Unfortunately for Charlotte, she spends her wedding night alone. But that Charlotte is a long way from the confident queen that we know. That queen gets woken up in the middle of the night by her doctor. And she thinks that it's the news of the king being dead. But she finds out, no, it's the princess royal who died in childbirth carrying what would be the heir to the throne. This puts the future of the monarchy in question. It's something that Whistledown writes about. How the queen is so good at matchmaking, and yet, even though her and the king have 13 children, they have no heirs to speak of. It's not a good look. So after the funeral, Charlotte meets with all of her children and just yells at them to make her an heir. Now, her sons, they have plenty of children, but they're all illegitimate. 
No, she needs them to actually marry somebody. Somebody of name recognition, value, and someone who can bring her a baby. Her daughters, they've never been married. Basically, Charlotte and the king have 13 deadbeat kids. So she orders them to hop to it and get her some grandbabies ASAP. In episode two, the big story post-wedding day is what Parliament is calling it. They're calling it the Great Experiment, marrying a white guy to a black woman. But because the Crown put their neck out to make sure that this thing went through, it's very important that it is successful. But in order to make sure it is a success, they need to make sure that the couple consummated the relationship or not. It's all the princess and her group of advisors can discuss. Whether or not the king and the queen did the damn thing. You've got a guy like Lord Bute who has the voice of parliament and he's pretty concerned. The fact that they don't know. But then you've got the princess reassuring everybody that she's convinced her son was able to do the deed. And one of the reasons it's such a big deal whether or not the two had sex is because the relationship isn't legitimate until the two are trying to have babies. So the princess and her advisors need to figure out whether or not the couple hooked up. And of course, they didn't. The queen is bored out of her mind. She wakes up and asks Brimsley, what do I have on the schedule? But he tells her, well, nothing. It's your honeymoon. And at first, it's okay. I mean, she is in this beautiful house surrounded by servants who are there to be to her beck and call. But after a few days, she is bored senseless. So much so that she tells Brimsley, get the carriage ready. I'm going to queue which is pretty unheard of. Queens don't just drop by. They kind of announce their presence, but Charlotte doesn't play those kind of games. So it's a surprise visit. It's one that the King and Reynolds don't really have a lot of time to prepare for. But when she does arrive, Reynolds informs her that the King is in the observatory. And Charlotte has never seen an observatory before. So the King is excited to show her one because one of his passions is astronomy. But Charlotte's actually insulted. She figured that the king would rather spend time in a brothel, and while that is bad, at least it's understandable. But this? The fact that the king was blowing her off to be with planets millions of miles away? She doesn't really know how to take that, and she's not taking it well. Just like the other night, the king can't quite understand what her gripe is, and she yells at him, George, you're telling me I'm the queen and I can do whatever I want, but I can't. I can't go to the Modiste. I can't go out. I can't make friends. I know one person in this country, and it's you. And you would rather hang out with the stars than hang out with me. And George doesn't know what to say to that. And the fact that he stays quiet infuriates the queen even more so that she ends up leaving. When she arrives back at her carriage, Brimsley and Reynolds were just coming back outside. They were inside because if the king and queen aren't going to hook up, Brimsley and Reynolds will hook up. The next day, though, Brimsley and Reynolds are called upon by the princess because she feels like if anybody would know whether the king and the queen consummated their relationship, it would be their right-hand men. But Reynolds and Brimsley don't really divulge anything. They say all the right things, like the king and the queen are enjoying their honeymoon, they're getting along swimmingly, but they don't really answer the princess's questions because they just don't want to betray the trust. Of course, they know that the couple didn't consummate their relationship, but how do you tell the princess that? So they decide not to. But they do know that it's important that the couple finally start to, you know, do adult stuff. And Brimsley kind of pushes it on Reynolds because, after all, it is the king who seems to be the one not interested. Reynolds doesn't know how exactly he's going to do that. And Brimsley suggests maybe you have the king make a gesture. So at the behest of Reynolds, the king does that. He sends a note over that tells Charlotte, I never want you to feel alone. And then he gifts her a Pomeranian. It's an adorable dog, but she hates it. She calls it a deformed bunny. Fast forward a week, and the loneliness, even with the Pomeranian, is getting to Charlotte. She tells Brimsley, I'm going to meet with my ladies-in-waiting. But he says, you know, that's really unwise of you to do. To meet with all of your ladies-in-waiting at once, it's pretty unheard of. Now, if you were to meet with, say, one lady-in-waiting, a discreet lady-in-waiting, I think that would be okay. And what he means is somebody who can keep their mouth shut because they have to keep this hush-hush. The queen isn't supposed to have any visitors during her honeymoon. Brimsley suggests that she invite over Lady Danbury. And Lady Danbury is more than happy to get an invite to go anywhere because even though they have the new fancy title of Lord and Lady, nothing has changed for them. Her husband is not invited in the exclusive clubs. He's not invited out to the hunts. 
he's basically left at home. And if he's left at home, his pastime is to have sex with his wife, who definitely doesn't want to do that. So Lady Danbury's kind of miserable. She's just thrilled to get out of the house for whatever reason. When she does go over to the palace to have some tea, there is a feeling out process. After all, these two women don't really know each other. But when they finally get some alone time, Lady Danbury's honest with the queen and tells her, you're a terrible liar. I mean, when you told me that you enjoyed the king's company, I could tell that you were lying. So you might want to fix that. But hey, don't beat yourself up too much. Your wedding night doesn't have to be perfect. My wedding night was horrible. My husband's way older than me, and it just wasn't enjoyable at all. It was pretty miserable. And that's when the queen opens up about just how miserable her wedding night was for her, about how George left her there all alone. And that begs the question from Lady Danbury, well, did you guys consummate the relationship? And she realizes that they didn't. Danbury then stresses the importance of doing so. She reminds Charlotte that it wasn't too long ago queens were killed for not having enough babies. And now you've got a situation where you're not having sex with the king. It's not a good look, especially considering your relationship isn't valid until you do so. Then she realizes, though, that the queen is only 17 years old, and she probably has no idea what to expect. So Danbury grabs some paper and pencils and starts drawing out sex positions, telling Charlotte what she can expect when they finally get down to it. Charlotte seems a little hesitant to do this because she doesn't like George, and Danbury isn't doing a good job selling the benefits of sex. So when she shows hesitation, Danbury tells her, you have to do this. You are the first of your kind. And she hints at the importance of doing so for people that look like them. Now, even though this meeting was supposed to be discreet, people talk. Danbury was seen by servants, servants talked to other servants, and word got to the princess that Lady Danbury had a private meeting with Charlotte. The princess needs some eyes and ears in that castle. She needs to know what is going on, and it certainly seems like Charlotte is taking a liking to Lady Danbury. So the very next day, the princess calls to have tea with Lady Danbury, and she tells her, I need to know what is going on in there. And Lady Danbury explains that she is more than willing to tell the princess whatever she wants, But she wants something in return. First thing is, the title of Lord and Lady usually comes with property. Property they haven't gotten. So they're going to want that. But more than anything, she wants her husband to be respected. She wants her husband to be able to get into those exclusive clubs and to go on hunts. And she doesn't really want this for her husband. She just wants him off of her. It's a big ask, but then again, the princess does want this information really badly. So she accepts. And a couple days later, the Danbury's move into their palatial new house. But Danbury isn't actually planning on telling the princess any information. She's going to tell her a bunch of generic stuff and not betray what Charlotte tells her in private. Now, as for Charlotte, that night, she actually has a dinner guest. It's King George. He thought she would be thrilled to see him, but she's not. She's actually infuriated. She starts walking out of the room and he stops her and says, No, Charlotte, I'm sorry. I didn't realize how difficult this was for you, but let me show you where I've been. And he takes her to the observatory. He shows her a part of his passion, his obsession, really. And she seems to be into it. He then kisses her, apologizes once again, and informs her that he will be moving in to the house where she is. And the first night that they sleep under the same roof, they both lose their virginity to each other. The next morning, though, when the queen wakes up, she's looking all over for George, and Brimsley tells her, well, I think he has a visitor, and he does. His mother came. Charlotte overhears the conversation because it gets pretty contentious. The queen came because she wanted to know if the two had hooked up or not, and the king yells at his mother, you told me to wed, I did. You told me to charm her, to make it easier for the crown, I did my best. You told me not to let her know me because I must protect the secrets of the crown, I've done that as well. Then you told me to bed her, I have done so. I realize the pressure of being king. Nobody realizes it more than me. And while the king didn't mean to make Charlotte feel bad because he didn't even know she overheard this, it does. It makes her feel like everything that happened the previous night was fake. Once the princess leaves, though, the king ends up having a little bit of a fit. He collapses in a chair, his arm is shaking. Reynolds asks him, should I go get the doctor? And the king says, yes. But Charlotte, and Reynolds cuts him off and says, sir, she'll never know. 
Now, the modern day queen, she is having trouble because none of her kids want to get married. She needs tips. She calls Lady Bridgerton and Lady Danbury to a meeting, and more so, she wanted to talk to Bridgerton. She asked Lady Bridgerton, you have all these kids, and they all wanted to get married. How did you do it? And Lady Bridgerton says, well, it doesn't hurt if it's for love. That's the ultimate motivation. It does spark a little bit of debate between Lady Bridgerton and Lady Danbury. After all, the two women did marry for different reasons. Lady Bridgerton marrying for love, and Lady Danbury, well, she hated her husband, so she looks at marriage as nothing more than a duty. But between this conversation, somehow the queen decides, okay, I will put a list together of eligible women who my son can marry, and they can worry about the love later. Because this woman is hell-bent on having an heir to the throne. In episode three, it's coronation day. It's a huge day. The problem is the king and the queen, they're not together. Brimsley goes down in the basement, and he's looking for the king. And Reynolds tells him that he's currently busy with his studies. But Brimsley sees that the king is actually with a physician. And it's super weird because why would you hide that? When Brimsley sees this, he asks Reynolds, why is he being examined? But Reynolds just tells him, you didn't see that. Coronation Day is nothing more than a big ruse. For the public, it looks like the king and the queen are in love. They're united. When in reality, as soon as they get behind closed doors, they go their separate ways. The queen has really taken to Lady Danbury. She confides in her quite a bit. And Lady Danbury tells Charlotte, as soon as you're with child, you're good. But that's easier said than done. Because Charlotte explains to Lady Danbury, that is all we do. Trust me, we are getting it on quite a bit. They even schedule this. Every other day, the two hook up. And while they don't like each other, these two hate fuck the shit out of each other. I mean, it's hot, it's passionate, it's steamy. Their arguments turn into sex. And they don't even care who's watching. At one point, they start doing it on the dining room table with an entire staff around. When she does get a moment to herself, she asks Brimsley about the upcoming season and how often she's expected to host balls and palace events. And she's surprised at his answer. Turns out the king doesn't really do that type of thing. She starts wondering aloud why exactly would a guy that seems like he's got it all together not want to host events. And Brimsley talks out of turn and says, maybe it has to do with the doctor. But as soon as he says it, he realizes he shouldn't have said it. He tips Charlotte off to the fact that her husband was seeing another physician that isn't the palace physician. And now her head's kind of racing as to why that was. Later that day, after one of their bang sessions, she asks him, are you not well? I mean, I heard you saw a doctor in the cellar. And he plays it off like, well, yeah, it was coronation day. I had to be inspected. But she wisely points out, I'm the queen, and I wasn't inspected. You think there would be doctors over me than you because all anyone cares about is whether I'm a child or not. But George doesn't actually tell her any information, and it pisses her off. But the question of whether or not Charlotte is with a child is all anyone can think about, especially the princess. She meets with Agatha Danbury, And Danbury tells her that the wedding night was great, the two get along. She basically lies to the princess. She doesn't reveal anything that Charlotte actually tells her. She basically just tells Agatha what she would want to hear. The princess says, okay, well, keep your attention on it because there's pressure. And the pressure is coming from a guy named Lord Butte. But the pressure goes away if Charlotte is with child because it seals the great experiment. As the princess is talking about this, it gives Lady Danbury an opening to suggest throwing a ball. Lord Danbury really wanted to host the first ball of the season. So Agatha throws it to the princess. Hey, how about us? It would make sense. I'm one of the queen's ladies and also the obvious. It would show a sign of unity. And initially the princess says, no, that's not going to happen. But Lady Danbury wields her power by saying, well, if you want these teas to continue, then... You should probably look into it. And the princess says, I will address it with Lord Butte. But in order to guarantee that she hosts the first ball of the season, Lady Danbury goes home. She tells Coral, send out invitations. If there's invites, then it doesn't give Lord Butte or the princess an opportunity to say no. She sends the invitations out, but when she gets to the palace the next day, a lot of the people are RSVPing no. Most of them are a part of the court. 
which hurts Agatha quite a bit. They're not really giving an explanation, but we all know the explanation. And this invitation gate is a huge deal. Parliament is actually in an uproar. People are refusing to go, and the charge is being led by Lord Ledger's wife. If you're wondering who Lord Ledger is, he's Violet Bridgerton's father. His wife is racist. He and his daughter, though, feel the exact opposite. They like the great experiment. They're cool with it. They don't look down on anybody. But his wife, she's a real see you next Tuesday. And she doesn't want anyone going to the first ball of the season if it's being held at the Danbury's. So when Agatha goes to the palace the next day, she asks Charlotte for help, saying, could you encourage the other ladies-in-waiting to attend? Charlotte can't quite figure out what the issue is, but she's also distracted. That's because she's looking outside and she sees George in the garden. And he says that he's a farmer, but she just finds it really hard to believe that the King of England would actually be a farmer. But it appears that that might actually be the case. The Queen, though, gets distracted because she sees her husband out in the garden, shirtless, looking like a real snack. Lady Danbury gets the conversation back to her topic and explains how important it is that the Queen get people to attend. She gets her to understand what an impact it is for their kind of people. She doesn't come right out and say, this ball is important and everything you do is important for black people, but she's saying it without saying it. And Charlotte does get the message. That night, after one of their hookup sessions, they have a conversation about how gardening helps George feel like a normal person. Charlotte's feeling all lovey-dovey, and she asks him for help, telling him, I know you don't like social gatherings, but can you please go to this one? Because Charlotte is well aware that if she goes, everybody's going. And to his credit, the king says yes. So when Lord and Lady Danbury host the first ball of the season... Everybody shows up because they don't want to not be in attendance when the king and the queen of England arrive. Overall, it's a rousing success for the great experiment. Unfortunately, Lord Danbury wants to celebrate like he always does. And that's just bad news for Lady Danbury. However, this night is different because the thrusting stops. And it's not because Lord Danbury finished, it's because he died. Lady Danbury goes to check on him and she sees, yeah, no, he's gone. She goes out, she gets Coral, and she excitedly tells her the news. Agatha Danbury had been waiting for this day since she married this guy. But she also has to put on a strong face and act like she's upset. Only Lady Danbury and Coral know the truth, that this is a good thing for them. As for Charlotte and George, they discuss the fact that they really made an impact that night. With one party, they made more change than Britain had made in the last century. They then head to bed, but Charlotte's awoken in the middle of the night by scratching. She goes to see what it is, thinking that it might be George, and it absolutely is George, but it's not at the same time. George isn't his normal self. He's drawing on the walls and talking to himself about Venus. He then flees when Charlotte tries to talk to him, and he rushes out into the garden, stripping down and yelling at the planet for Venus to come down. It takes Charlotte actually telling him, I'm Venus. I'm here, and I'm going inside, so you should too. But it's at this moment that Charlotte realizes the magnitude of George's disability, one that she didn't even know was present. Even with the disability, though, the two had a whole lot of kids, and modern-day Charlotte is puzzled, puzzled as to why it is that her daughter's never married. She asks Brimsley for his best guess, And he's hesitant to tell her, but eventually he says, your daughters didn't want to marry because you're stuck here in this state. Your husband is still alive, and maybe if he had died earlier, it would be one thing. They could have moved on, but they don't want to leave you like this. And that's just a tough reality for the queen to stomach. In episode four, we get a look through the eyes of King George on this one. He never wanted to marry. He wanted to focus on more important things like farming, agriculture, giving his people cheap food. He didn't really care about the whole royal baby thing. But the princess told him that the war was draining their bank accounts. And with the American colonies threatened to withhold taxes, the people need a king, not a farmer. When the princess, though, does tell George that Charlotte is on her way, she's actually on a ship headed to London, he starts to have a breakdown. It's something that most of the people in the room have never seen from their king before. So the princess, who knows what to expect, quickly ushers them out of the room so they don't see any more of it. George's condition is something that they need to figure out quickly. 
The princess had hired a bunch of doctors. They had a bunch of theories, but none of them had actually cured him. There was one doctor, though, whose methods they hadn't tried yet. His name is Dr. Monroe, and he's from a psychiatric ward. He thinks this is mental, not physical. And while the other doctors dismiss him as a quack, the princess tells them, well, your methods haven't worked, so we're going to go with this guy. See if we can get the king right before his wedding day. Monroe is convinced that just by talking to George, he can cure George. And the early results are good. He talks to George, and George is able to snap out of the funk that he's in. George worked with Monroe for a week, and on his wedding day, when he heard that Charlotte had disappeared, he tried to do the same thing, run away, because it was clear to him that Charlotte didn't want this wedding any more than he did. He gets stopped, though, by Monroe, who slaps the crap out of him, something that no one's ever done to the king, and tells him to snap out of it. George then walks the grounds, found Charlotte, convinced her to stay, and the two got married. They were happy, at least for a few hours. That is until the big blow-up when he told Charlotte, you're going to stay here, I'm going to stay somewhere else. Once he did leave, he headed to the observatory, and he told Reynolds, here's the problem with her. She's extremely clever. That's part of the reason why I can't hook up with her. If she were ugly, if she were dull, I might feel up to the task. Instead, I feel like I don't deserve her. That girl belongs as far from me as she can get. So it wasn't that King George didn't want to be with Charlotte. He desperately wanted to be with her. He felt like he wasn't worthy of being with Charlotte. That is why he stayed far away from her. This setup seemed to work for George at least, but he was surprised when she just showed up out of the blue one day to confront him about what exactly he was doing in their marriage. Because of this, he realized that if he were to continue and not be with Charlotte, he was going to drive the most beautiful thing he'd ever met away from him. So the next day, he called on Dr. Monroe and said, I need you to try any method you can to fix me. If it's experimental, we need to do it. And Monroe was more than happy to oblige. The drastic therapy that Monroe wanted to use on the king was to make him obedient because he was so used to other people being at his beck and call that he had never suffered. He had never ate garbage food. He had never been assaulted. He was this prim and proper boy that always had his way. So Monroe wanted to break him, much like one would do with a puppy. Monroe would dunk the king's head in a bucket of ice until he was pretty close to passing out. He also used an electric chair on the guy. But after a few days, there were no results, and the king was getting restless. He asked Monroe, how much longer are we going to do this? Because if you keep at it, I'm not going to have a self to restore. And Monroe snaps back at him, this is called the terrific method. Terror is in the name. He uses the example of wolves in the Black Forest and how over time they had become tamed into tiny little dogs known as Pomeranians. And Monroe vows to do to the king what the Germans did to their wolves. So the king kept at it. But Reynolds was certainly concerned for his friend. Reynolds questions the doctor's methods and George admits I've questioned them too, but This is my only hope to ever be with her. And Reynolds reminds him, you're the king. You can be with her whenever you want. George, though, still thought that he wasn't safe enough to be with her. But he did think, well, maybe I can be near her. He would go and watch her from afar without her knowing. But he also wanted her to have something to keep her company. That's when he snuck down to Dr. Monroe's office and took one of those Pomeranians, gifting it to the queen, not realizing that the queen would hate that. The missing Pomeranian, though, is noticed by Monroe, and the next day as Monroe is shaving the king, he says that he's pretty sure the king has a mole because one of his dogs was missing. He doesn't realize it was the king, and if he does realize it, he doesn't say anything. But it becomes abundantly clear that it was the king when Reynolds comes in and says, Charlotte got your gift. She called it a deformed bunny, and the king just laughs at it. The king gets up and tells Monroe, you know what? No ice bath, no chair today, I'm good. And Monroe tries to command the king to stay, but he's not a dog, he's not trained. And he says, I'd rather work on my farm today. After doing this, he decided to go dine with Charlotte. And he thought Charlotte would be thrilled because he was spending time with her. He never expected her to be angry about it, but she was. That's the night where the king showed her the observatory and told her, I'm moving in. That was something that Monroe did not agree with. He thought that such a drastic life change would do irreversible damage to the king's progression. 
But still, Monroe disagreed with the decision. Although there's nothing he could do. He's arguing with the king. Shortly after moving in, though, that's when his episodes started happening more frequently. It was like he was living two lives. He was hooking up with his wife quite a bit, but he was also going to visit Dr. Monroe for treatment. He did all this in secret because he never wanted Charlotte to learn about Dr. Monroe. He does, though, piss off Monroe when he gives credit to Charlotte, saying that her methods have done more for him than Monroe or his chair ever could. He's going to keep Monroe around, but he has no interest in getting back in that chair and continuing his methods because he's smitten with Charlotte. The night of the ball, the night where he kind of went crazy, he woke up in the middle of the night, headed down to the kitchen, and he was surprised because there was Monroe standing there. And the king had made it clear to Monroe that he was to stay in the basement. But Monroe was making a kind of concoction, and he tells the king, I'm not making this for you, I'm making it for the queen. She found out that I was here, and she wanted my help. She wanted the doctor that the king was going to. And she wants my help because she's with child. So, congrats. And the news that he was going to finally be a father is the thing that really set him off. That's what made him go nuts that night. When he woke up the next day, he was naked, alone, and wondering what the hell happened to him. And I understand how that feels. It was my entire sophomore year of college. He was wondering where Charlotte went, and she went to go confront the princess about what exactly is going on with her son. There was a few things in the palace that she recognized and thought it was nothing but a coincidence. For example, when he moved in, all the knives suddenly were dull. The windows were locked. She just thought that it was nothing until last night when he was in the garden talking to the sky. That's when she realized these weren't coincidences. These were calculated plans to make sure the king didn't harm himself. Charlotte blames the princess for not letting her know, and the princess fights back, saying that Charlotte shouldn't be sitting there criticizing, having no idea what a mother goes through. And it won't be until she is a mother that she truly knows the struggle. They continue to go back and forth on why Augusta held this information from Charlotte. But they are unaware that King George is listening to the entire conversation from outside the door. And after hearing this, he heads down to the basement, finds Dr. Monroe, and sits back in the chair for more treatment. In episode 5, the king continues to go through his treatment while his wife wonders her future. That future is going to include a kid, but it's also going to include her mother-in-law. The princess, along with Lord Butte, bring over a physician to check out Charlotte, and he confirms that she is in fact with child. And when the princess hears this, she decides, that's it. I'm moving in. I need to make sure that everything is ready for the royal heir's arrival. That is not exactly what Charlotte wants. Charlotte is writing George quite a bit, and she's not receiving word back, which is really frustrating. She sends Brimsley to go give the message to Reynolds, and Reynolds tries to give the message to the king, but when he finally does see the king, the king just says, put it with the others, because he's still going through treatment, even though he looks like he's in really bad shape. And when he says put it with the others, you find out that Charlotte's written him probably 20 times and hasn't received a response. And so the member of the family that Charlotte wants to be with her is gone. He's MIA. He's not returning notes. And the person from the family she wants nothing to do with is now living right down the hall. This is Charlotte's living hell. And it's not like the princess is being all that accommodating. In fact, she's kind of insulting. At one point, the princess is getting a portrait done, and she commands the painter to make her skin color more like it actually is, darker. But the princess stands up and says, no, I want it more pale, because she wants to hide how black her daughter-in-law truly is. When that happens, Charlotte writes another letter, but this time it's not to George, it's to Adolphus. And curiosity gets the best of Brimsley, so he decides to do something that he really shouldn't. He decides to open up and read it. And he finds out that the princess is planning on leaving. She's writing Adolphus because in order to leave, she needs a country to give her haven and a male protector. Brimsley doesn't know what to do. He knows that the queen can't leave. I mean, she's got to stick this thing out. So he goes and asks Reynolds, should I mail this? But Reynolds says, nothing can be done. Post it. And what Brimsley was hoping Reynolds would say is, don't post it. I'll tell the king and he'll jump in and act. But Reynolds isn't about to do that. So Brimsley posts it, and a couple weeks later, Adolphus arrives. Brimsley allows Adolphus to talk to Charlotte privately. 
And this is the first time that Adolphus is finding out his sister is pregnant. But that's when she also tells him, I'm pregnant, but I want to go home. When Adolphus says, no, I can't do that. She reminds him that when she showed up, he said that he couldn't say no to the British Empire. And now she is the British Empire. She's commanding him to take her home. And Adolphus tries to explain to her that he can't take her home because he would be surely starting a war. She's carrying the heir to the British Empire. For her to flee and Adolphus to be a accomplice in that, it would bring war upon their small area of Germany. And he's not about to do that. He then reveals why else it would be difficult for him to bring her home. When he negotiated her marriage, he also was able to include an alliance between his small province and Britain. So that small province is protected by the British Empire. Nobody's ever going to mess with them. And they really needed this alliance because there were other provinces that were gunning for him. So he kind of did this to save the people of the area. This news sucks for Charlotte because she's just been used. That night, Adolphus, Charlotte, and to her dismay, the princess all eat together. But Charlotte is completely despondent throughout the entire meal. As the trio is enjoying some music, the princess turns to Charlotte and says, Your duty is done. You have conceived an heir. Now, you're free. I mean, you never have to see my son again if you don't want to. That is, at least until we need another heir. That hurts Charlotte. Because it seems like everybody is basically just telling her that she's nothing more than either a pawn for an alliance or a pawn to make babies. There is one person who is looking out for Charlotte, and that's Brimsley. He's really concerned with her. He races over to Reynolds to talk to him, and he says, I've never seen her like this. You have to go talk to the king. But Reynolds just continues to shut Brimsley out. He does, though, go searching for the king after Brimsley leaves. And normally he gets shut out at the door, but this time he's not willing to do it. He bursts through the door to see exactly what they're doing to the king, and he's horrified. He tries to get him to stop, but the group of people just throw him out and continue to go through the treatment. It looks like there's just no hope. And after striking out with Reynolds, or at least so he thought, Brimsley the next day pleads with Charlotte, telling her, you can't leave England. She's going to need to get some advice from somebody, so she goes and meets with Lady Danbury. Danbury has had quite a busy few weeks. She buried her husband, and while she thought it would be an enjoyable experience because she hated him, she actually found herself grieving, and then questioning why she was grieving. But there was a bigger issue at hand. While mourning, she gets a visit from a couple of lords, the Duke of Hastings, several other families, and they're all wondering the same thing. What happens now? They've all recently gotten this title because of the Great Experiment, but the first one to die was Lord Danbury. So they're worried that the titles will be taken away, and they won't be passed down through the bloodline, which is customary. But because they look different than everybody else, i.e. they're not white, they're wondering what exactly happens. They felt like they could come to Danbury with this because she is a trusted member of the court, and she has a son. Now, granted, he's only four years old, but he should become the new Lord Danbury. But then again, we're entering uncharted waters. She's going to have to ask the royal family. That is something she really didn't want to do, though. She takes her adorable four-year-old over to the palace and explains to him that he is now the man of the family. He is the new Lord Danbury. And when she gets in front of the princess, she introduces her son as Lord Danbury. And initially, the princess says, it's great to meet you, Lord Danbury, but she gets stopped by that D-bag, Lord Butte, who informs her that the question of inheritance is far from decided. So unfortunately, Lady Danbury leaves the palace not having any idea what happens with bloodlines inheriting titles. Now, it's not all bad for Danbury. One day, just to kind of clear her thoughts, she started walking. But she learned that she's not the only one who does this, because so does Lord Ledger. She's always been friendly with Lord Ledger, but they strike up a conversation and they agree to meet the next day and walk. And then the next day they walk. And next thing you know, they're meeting up every single day to walk and talk and they form a real bond, a bond that comes dangerously close to crossing a line. Now, Lord Ledger catches himself and he walks back knowing that he is married, he has a daughter, but he can't stop thinking about Agatha Danbury. So much so that he knows her birthday is coming up and he makes her a hat. 
It's something that he does for everybody close in his life. It's really, though, just an excuse to go over to her house. And while they both know they shouldn't, they end up hooking up. And for the first time in her life, Agatha Danbury has sex and enjoys it. Suddenly, she's in a pretty good mood. She is surprised, though, when Queen Charlotte visits her, and Charlotte used the excuse of wanting to give condolences after Lord Danbury died. In reality, though, she came because she wants a place to stay. She's decided that she can't stay in the palace anymore. She needs to go home. And Lady Danbury feels for Charlotte, but she also knows that Charlotte's putting her in a really tough situation because she can't sit there and basically kidnap the queen. That's how it would be perceived. And it would end with her head off of her body. So she asks Coral to go get Brimsley and Adolphus. A short while later, they arrive back, and Charlotte doesn't want to see either of them. What she needs is a friend. She tells Lady Danbury, everybody in this country has betrayed me. They've lied to me, except one, you. And Lady Danbury sits down and says, I need a friend too. But up until this point, I haven't been your friend. I've been your subject. And that's on me. All I've done is look at you as a crown and nothing more. But for us to truly be friends, I think we need to start over. They agree in that moment to be friends. And then they have a conversation about what it's like being a woman in a man's world. This conversation helps Charlotte quite a bit. And when she leaves, she's in a much better mood. She also flips a switch. She goes from being a 17-year-old girl lost in a foreign country to being the Queen of England. An utter bad bitch. And the Queen decides to go get her man. She heads off to Kew and she wants to know where her husband is. The doctor doesn't want the Queen to interject. But Reynolds is more than happy to say, I'll show you where the king is. Because Reynolds struck out trying to get them to stop, but maybe the queen will have some luck. And she does. When she sees what they're doing to the king, she is mortified. It takes a little bit, but she's able to get the king to at least remember who she is and kind of snap out of the funk he's in. She then commands her soldiers to pack up all of the doctor's things and make sure that he never returns. She's taking over. Now, the modern-day queen... She has had some luck. She's been able to find two women to marry off to two of her sons, although they're not happy about it. They actually try to get their brother to interject because he is technically in charge and has to sign off on any marriages that go through the royal family. But the queen is actually in charge, and she says, do me a favor, um, approve your brother's marriages. And he says, yeah, okay, they're approved. So two weddings go down, and there's two chances at getting an heir to the throne. Over with Lady Bridgerton, she's going through a bunch of emotions. Lately, she's been feeling some things. Things that she hasn't felt in a long time and she's conflicted. The woman needs to get laid. I mean, she looks at a provocative painting and she's getting a lady boner. She confides in Lady Danbury about this, but right away she gets embarrassed and stops. And Lady Danbury has to explain to her, what you're feeling is perfectly fine. I know, you love your husband, everybody knows you love your husband, you don't show up about him. But your husband hasn't been able to perform his husbandly duties in quite some time. So girl, do yourself a favor, go get some. It's perfectly natural. And in the season finale, you would think that the king would be happy that she stepped in and interjected, stopping his treatments. No, he's actually pissed off. He commands her to leave, but she refuses. She tells him, you know, I always thought that you stayed away from me because you thought I was kind of a disease. But no, recently it dawned on me that it might be the other way around. That you stay away from me because you actually care for me. Perhaps you stay away because you love me. So I'm going to ask you, do you love me? And the king doesn't want to have this conversation. He also can't fathom how anyone could love him and want a life with him because he's crazy. But Charlotte says, well, I love you. I love you, George. And after hearing this and realizing that the queen is being sincere and the queen is willing to have this life with him and stand by him even through all of his faults, he admits, I love you too. They vow then to attack this crazy world together as man and wife, king and queen. Now, not too far away, the princess finds out through the king's former doctor that Charlotte is now calling the shots. This is a big deal that the king has stopped his medical procedures. Lord Bute, a couple of other advisors, they all meet with the princess. And their concern is that the king isn't actually fit to run the country. 
He hasn't addressed Parliament in quite some time, and now he's stopped treatment. The princess tries to tell everybody that the king is fine, but she's a terrible liar. Lord Bute calls her out on it, saying, uh, if he's fine, then he's good enough to address Parliament, so I'll tell them that they should expect him. The princess has to find out, though, what the status is of the king. So she meets with her spy, Lady Danbury. Before it even gets brought up, the elephant in the room of what happens with the title Lord Danbury has to be addressed. The princess tells Lady Danbury that whether or not the great experiment goes past this generation is something only his majesty can determine. But she's pretty sure she can expedite an answer if Danbury has some information that may be useful to her. Lady Danbury doesn't want to betray her friend. But it's also pretty clear that unless she comes up with some information to give the princess that the princess finds worthy, the whole issue of the titles being passed down is likely to be no. Coral brings up just asking the queen, because after all, she is a friend. But Lady Danbury doesn't want to burden the queen with that. After all, she's pretty close to giving birth. While she waits around, though, for Lady Danbury's information, the princess decides to go see if she can get some of her own. She heads to Kew to meet with her son, but she gets told by Charlotte that the king is not receiving visitors at this time. The princess tries to kind of wield her power, but Charlotte wields the ultimate trump card. Hey, I'm the queen now. You ain't shit. I did use some artistic liberties with that. The princess, however, snaps back at Charlotte and says, What you fail to understand is once a king is born, there's no hiding him. You, right now, are trying to hide him. But by doing so, you're putting his crown in jeopardy. He has a country, he has people, he's got a rule. Lord Bute is waiting, the government is growing restless and suspicious. He cannot hide. He has to face Parliament. Right after the princess leaves, Charlotte goes to tell George, you've got to address Parliament. George agrees with his wife and he starts preparing a speech. As Charlotte awaits her husband to go off and address Parliament, she meets with Lady Danbury to get caught up. And Charlotte gives Lady Danbury an opening. She asks her, is there anything I can do for you? But Lady Danbury says, no, no, I'm I'm good. This, This is fine. They then talk about how painful giving birth is. As Lady Danbury is leaving, she gets approached by Charlotte's brother, Adolphus. He likes himself, Lady Danbury. He also knows that she is recently widowed. He wants to call for her. It seems like this kind of settles things for Lady Danbury. She will marry Adolphus, and her problems will be solved. She tells Coral all about this, and Coral says, Well, I thought Lord Ledger. And it turns out Lord Ledger ended things. He didn't want to, but it's kind of hard to carry on an affair. Not that I would know, by the way. So the plan for Lady Danbury going forward is just to marry Adolphus and be taken care of. Adolphus, though, will be sticking around for the time being because he's waiting on the birth of the royal heir. And if you think childbirth is stressful now, oh boy, it was a lot more stressful back then. There's blood everywhere, no one knows what's going on, but after a very painful labor, the child is born. They creatively name him George. Shortly after the birth of baby George, Lady Danbury and the princess once again have tea. The princess asks Danbury if there's any news from the house that she can divulge. And Lady Danbury says, well, is there a decision on if my son is the Lord or not? The princess knows that Lady Danbury knows something. She's just not giving any information. So she tells her a little bit about her life. How after her husband died, she had to kind of throw herself at the mercy of the king. This in order to secure George's future. She didn't want to. Because that king was horrible, but she did so because she had to. So she basically tells her, look, even though it's hard, you got to do what you got to do for your kids. She then asks her, so what do you have to tell me? But Lady Danbury, holding back tears, says, well, I guess that depends on what the title of my son is. A couple days later, George is supposed to go and address Parliament. He never gets to. He puts on the suit, he gets in the carriage, he arrives, but he can't bring himself to do it. He has a little bit of a fit. They have to bring him back to the palace. When Charlotte finds out, she goes to check on George, who is lying under their bed. He's just trying to hide from the world. Charlotte gets under there with him and has him explain to her what happened. 
And he says, I couldn't do it. I couldn't even read the words on the page. He starts beating himself up, and Charlotte stops him, reminding him that he is the king, and he is the one that she loves. And through thick or thin, they're in this together now. There is, though, the issue of what happened at Parliament. I mean, he could lose this crown. If Lord Butte gets his way, then the king will be no more. So Charlotte says, you know what? If you can't go to Parliament, we'll bring Parliament to us. We'll host a gathering. We'll show them that you are healthy and fit to rule. Little do they know, though, that this is probably the king's final opportunity because Lord Butte and Parliament have had it up to here with this crap. So the invitations go out, and everything has to be perfect for this ball. When it starts, everybody is waiting for Charlotte and George. And after a little bit, they finally make their grand entrance. And it's a struggle. I mean, George is having severe anxiety, but it's Charlotte who helps him through it. And it's Charlotte who presents to everybody a strong king, one that they can have faith in. He even gets up, he makes a speech, and he welcomes everybody, announcing the birth of their child, George IV. Two people who are at this ball are Lady Danbury and Charlotte's brother, Adolphus, who has asked her to marry him. But she cannot. At the event, she ends up turning him down. The thought about leaving and going to Germany and having more kids and all of it just doesn't sit right with her. There's also the whole fact of Lord Ledger. He's still living rent-free in her mind. So while, yeah, Adolphus would afford her a great life, she says, no, I'm not doing it. As Lady Danbury was turning Adolphus down, Charlotte was having a surprise conversation with the princess. The princess finally has respect for the queen. The princess tells Charlotte, all I ever wanted for my son was to be happy. And you make him happy. Thank you. It seems like Charlotte has finally been accepted. She does, however, find out about Lady Danbury turning Adolphus down, and she goes to confront her about it. Her big issue isn't the fact that Lady Danbury said no to her brother. Her big issue is the fact that she found out what was going on with Lady Danbury and the title being passed down. And she's mad that her friend didn't ask for help on this matter, because the queen could have made this a non-issue. Lady Danbury just tries to tell her that I didn't want to burden you with these issues, but the queen calls that nonsense, reminding her that the two are friends and reassuring her that her son is Lord Danbury. Charlotte goes back to rejoin George, and George is having trouble finding anybody who's going to drink with him. So when he sees Charlotte, he says, finally, somebody who will drink with me. But she tells him, I can't. Because Charlotte is once again with child. It makes you wonder if George even let her recover before knocking her up again. But, hey, mazel tov. Now, of course, those are just two of the 13 children. Two recently were wed off, but the modern-day queen is still hell-bent on finding an heir to the throne. She's been pressuring her kids quite a bit, and two of them come to her and stand up to her. They tell her, you have no idea the stress you've put us under. I mean, you don't care. You have no idea how many children I've lost. They criticize her for a lack of compassion and also question her as a mother, telling her she never was one. She's only been a queen. This hurt Charlotte quite a bit. It gives the queen a little bit of a pause. But she does end up, at the end of the show, getting good news. They finally are going to get their heir. One of the recently married couples found out that they were having a kid, and Charlotte rushes over to tell George. George, at this point, is pretty far gone. But Charlotte still loves him, and she gives him the good news that they will be grandparents. The family lineage will live on. Now, somebody who's already grandparent is Lady Bridgerton. She meets up with Lady Danbury, and they discuss how exactly Lady Danbury can go about putting herself out there. She doesn't, however, know if she wants to join the season. What she does know is she wants herself a flesh walrus. She wants to feel that touch of another man. She heads on over to Lady Danbury to discuss this, and Lady Danbury had mentioned how she, too, after the death of Lord Danbury, had flings. She even brought up her fling with the Queen's brother, but she never told Violet about the fling with her father. Doesn't matter, though. Lady Bridgerton finds out because she accidentally sees the hat that her father made for Lady Danbury years ago, and she knows. She kind of brings it up to Lady Danbury without bringing it up to Lady Danbury, And there's just an understanding now between the two women. It's a, I know what you did, 
And it seems like, at least to me, that Lady Bridgerton is okay with it. I remember it was awkward for me when my friend slept with my father. Anyway, that is the end of Season 1 of Queen Charlotte. Thank you so much for getting this part of the recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. I have a Patreon. I have merch. You can buy a shirt. I have a bunch of different ways you can give me money. I would appreciate it. But if not, I just appreciate you watching anyway. And be nice in the comments section because nasty comments make me feel bad.